praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is merciful. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they're troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, for the more we suffer for his cause and his kingdom and his work to reconnect the observing world back to God, the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when you will be scattered. Each one going his own way, leaving me alone, says Jesus. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I've told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you'll have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. Open our eyes to your scriptures. God, we are here on purpose. We want to know you more. We want to experience you more in a deeper way. And so, God, in this moment, we ask again that you would just be so present. God, that you would make us even more aware of your presence. God, that the songs we just sang and the, and the offering we just gave, God, would, be, would, would make its way back into our heart. God, that that posture of submission to you and surrender to you, God, it would just be so alive as we, as we read um, from your word today. So God, speak to us. We know that you're here. We believe that you are real, that you're good, that you love us, and that you lead to peace. So God, in this moment, I ask again that you would just do what only you can do and that you would come in and you would change hearts today. That you'd open our eyes to all the things that you want us to see so we might leave here different. So it's in your name that we have gathered, it's in your name that we have given, and in your name that we have sung, the name of Jesus, and we all said, amen. Hey, can we just thank the worship team and the choir for leading us this morning? I tell you what. That choir today, that was real, wasn't it? Wow, I love the power of all those voices. Welcome back, everyone. So glad you decided to be here today on this amazingly beautiful rainy day here in La Crescenta, the greatest city in the known world. So glad you decided to make it out. That's what I'm talking about. Um, There are about a thousand things that you could be doing today. Also, a special welcome to everyone tuning in on our live stream right now. Um, Because there's a thousand things you could be doing on your Sunday morning, and yet you chose to be here. You chose to be tuning in for any number of reasons, so good job. Good job for being here at church today. I truly believe that God wants to speak to you and that God wants to meet you in this place. He has an encouragement for you today, and so I'm so glad you made it. Just a couple of things before we dig into the Bible. Um, If it's your first time here, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome home. We hope this feels like home. We know that checking out a new church can be kind of weird, and so we just, we just pray that, that you found this place to be welcoming and hospitable, and, that, um, and, and we hope it feels like home. If you have any questions, make sure you stop by guest services, our little desk in the back of the auditorium at the end of service, and we'd love to be able to answer some questions. We also have a special gift for you, just in case you came for the first time, a, a new mug with some information about us, so stop by. Um, speaking of new things, we've got baptisms coming up March 15. We've got a graphic up there. Um, so far, I think we have between seven and eight confirmed, and it's going to be amazing. And so if you are a follower of Jesus and you haven't been baptized yet, you haven't surrendered your heart to his ways in, in, through the process and the practice of baptism, this is an awesome opportunity to do so. Just head to the website, forward slash baptism. Otherwise, you can stop by guest services in the back of the room and pick out an application for more information. Speaking of website, we have a new website that just launched on Friday, and it looks sharp, and it's, uh, we got a couple, couple claps for that. Special thanks to Tyla, um, our, our, our fearless uh, champion for the website to help make that happen. It looks great, and it's super useful, and, and all the information you need is on there, and so make sure you check it out. Um, Today, we're going to be taking communion immediately after the message. And so just so you know, that's happening. Also, after the message, we'll be taking our benevolent offering. And so if you want to be able to give, you can prepare to give for that. A couple of church business things real quick. And Dave, you can clear that screen for me. Um, uh, In your bulletins today, you'll find um, biographies of deacon nominations um, that, that are coming up for this next season. Make sure you review them. Make sure you read them. And you know who you are electing to be your leaders here at the church. Um, Next week, we're having a business meeting to present them to you as the community, and then the 22nd of March, we'll be voting on our budget, annual budget, and also our deacons for the next next season. So, does that feel good? 
So much information, so much information, it feels good. Uh, all right, well, today as we continue on in our series, Red Letters, from the Sermon on the Mount, today we're going to be taking a closer look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Yes, just one verse in the Bible with a lot of supporting text. And so I hope you brought your pen. If you're taking notes, which I always recommend, I'd like to call this message Paradise Lost and Found. Paradise Lost and Found. And as I was preparing for this morning, working with our, our pastors, uh, Manny and Jeff and Rebecca, the staff here, the leadership and elders, uh, sorry, the deacons, I, as we were processing this passage, I just kept coming back to this question or this experience of, have you ever walked into a moment or walked into uh, a situation or a season where you just knew something was off? You just knew, just knew it wasn't quite right. Like you saw this disconnect, right, between what was in front of you and what should have been in front of you, and it left you feeling this, this kind of weird, this weird tension. Like, I know, I know a classic example for me is when you order clothes online. Anyone ever ordered clothes online? Ugh. So you see this picture, and you just, you're like, man, I could wear that. I could, I could, fit, I could fit in that, right? I could fit in that. And, and so you add it to the cart, and three days later it shows up, and you're optimistic because you saw the picture. Expectations were high. You had high hopes because you, you remember seeing how it was supposed to look, right? But then you open up the bag, and, and then you go and hide in the bathroom to try it on, and, and only one part kind of fits because it was made for a 12-year-old, and the other one is way too big in all the wrong places. You know what I'm talking about. And, and, and you wonder why I always wear black, okay? It's because it's slimming, all right? I'm working on it, but... And you feel this tension, right? You open up the bag and you're just trying to sort it out and, and you're just like, man, that, that just ain't right. That ain't, that ain't right. Or, or maybe another example from my own life, you're welcome for all these illustrations, but you see this ad on TV for a new cell phone contract, right? And you're like, oh, this is too good to be true. And they promise, like, you can trade in anything and get a bunch of money off a new phone. And then, and then even better, it's only going to be 40 bucks a month. And you're like, this is amazing. So you go in all excited, expectations high, right? Because what you saw was one thing, but, but what you failed to see was the fine print, right? And so you go in and you trade in, like, a pretty decent thing. And you get, like, $10 off a $1,000 phone. And then there's, there's fee after fee after fee, and all of a sudden you're paying more than you, you were before in the first place. And, oh, man, there it is again, right? The tension, this disappointment, the confusion. And I would, I would even go so far as to say frustration or maybe even pain that can come in this disconnect, in the disconnect between what is and what should be. And I know those are, are kind of like silly illustrations, but I, I just wonder if anyone here has ever lived in an unexpected season of paradise lost. In the unknown between what you thought you were promised and what you actually experienced. I think my earliest memory of this reality came when I was probably eight or nine years old and my folks they scheduled this summer vacation that we were all super excited. We were literally going to paradise. We were heading to Southern California, right? And, um, and we were so pumped for Disney. I was eight or nine, so pumped for Disney and SeaWorld and the beach. When out of the blue, my mom, she gets a call saying that her dad had had a heart attack. Now, when you're eight, right, it, it's, it's already pretty challenging to, make, challenging to make sense of mortality in this, you know, we were thrust into this unknown season where we were forced to feel the tension of life and, and death. My invincible grandfather and my mother's stoic dad, right, laying in a hospital, no matter how much you try to process. Some of you have been here. So no matter how much you try to prepare for these moments, it still leaves you feeling like, man, this just isn't right. Some, some, this is not how it's supposed to be. My grandfather, who, who owned a gravel mill in the UP of Michigan, like as far north as you can get, right? Like, he's supposed to live forever. And me, I'm eight, I'm supposed to be on the beach, right? And now my dream of paradise, our dreams of paradise was lost. Well, he recovers. And, and we eventually visit the beach. And it was great, but... But the pattern that we experienced never stopped. It doesn't stop, does it? 
yeah, from, from girls breaking my heart in high school to brothers, my brother being consumed by addiction, to friends dying from cystic fibrosis, to people I trusted embezzling money, to my Aunt Catherine, her cancer is back again. The tension that we feel, it seems to not, to not disappear, but it, it actually seems to escalate. And it left me feeling like I'm so sure so many of you, like, like this just isn't how it's supposed to be, right? We're not, we're not supposed to get a divorce. They weren't supposed to commit suicide or overdose or have a miscarriage. That little girl wasn't supposed to die in her sleep. They weren't supposed to have an affair. They weren't supposed to lose their life savings in the housing crash. And what about, what about Syria, right? Like 200,000 people have died in this, in this war. What about the current state of sex trafficking and modern slavery in the world? 400 million people enslaved. What about the flooding in Mississippi, destroying cities, or the fires in Australia, or the coronavirus? The list, right? It could just keep going. On and on and on. And, and I, I, again, I don't know where everyone's been, but I, but I have to believe that everyone in this room has existed or has felt some sort of paradise lost in their life. Some tension between what is and what should be. And now here we are, right? We're living in the wake uh, of the disconnect between what is and what should be. And we're being handed more and more pieces every single day. And, and, and the world is just telling, all right, build life with this garbage piece. Build life with the broken pieces. And this is what we're told. This is our lot. This is our human experience. And it's all because of a simple decision, right? Something that happened a long time ago in a land far, far away. In a place and time where the world and humanity experienced its very first failure, its very first disappointment and fracture. With Adam and Eve, this is where we see paradise lost, right? Where the garden became a graveyard. And the world, the good world that God had made slowly started to unravel at the seams. And everything was perfect. Everything was great. There was no separation between what, between expectation and reality as God lived with his people and everything was obedient to his ways. But then these people, they were deceived into believing they deserved more, that they expected more, and, 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 and to, to chart their own course. And this sin, right, it caused a riff, not just then, but for all human history between what was and what should be. And it's affected every second of every day ever since. And yet from that moment in time, we see that God, our good father in heaven, the good father in heaven, he was working to make it right. Our God was planning a fix for the source of all the problems that we were forced to navigate through. And this fix, right? We now know on the other side of, of Calvary, on the other side of the resurrection, we know that this fix, fix was Jesus. But for thousands of years, in anticipation of the arrival of the fix, the Savior, the King, the Messiah, the one who would make things right, the assumption was that God's people would be the answer. That Israel would be the fix to the confusion and to the suffering of the world. They, would, they, they, they were the ones called to be set apart for God's glory. They were the ones that were called out to live and surrender to his ways. But Israel, even with all their wins and all their faith and all their obedience and all their cool moments, they, they always eventually failed to fulfill the charter that God gave them. And so the world continued to spin and spiral out of control all the way up to this passage that we're reading for today. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4 from the Sermon on the Mount. Where Jesus, he's speaking to a community that occupied more than most a life of disappointment. That lived in the thick of disappointment more than most. People who knew what God had said, that knew the promises, they knew the prophecies, and yet they were still living daily in poverty and oppression. They saw and felt the disconnect between expectation and reality on a different level, which is why when they heard about Jesus, right, this man, this man on the scene echoing 
Isaiah chapter 61, when they heard about Jesus bringing good news to the poor and proclaiming freedom for the captives, Jesus coming and telling everyone that the time of the Lord's favor has come, when they saw Jesus stepping into this promise from Isaiah chapter 61, they, they just had to see for themselves. They just had to check it out. They had to know if the paradise that had been lost in the garden was now able to be found. And this is where we picked up last week, Matthew 5, verse 3. With a little bit of a lead-in, it'll be on the screen, it says this. One day as he, Jesus, saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. He began to teach them, his disciples directly, but also this crowd, right? This, this group of people that had been following and traveling sometimes months to see him. The crowd uh, of sick and needy and broken and leftover and neglected and fractured people. And he tells them all, he tells his disciples and the crowds, he tells them about the good news of the coming kingdom of God. And what life in this kingdom is really like. And he starts with these beatitudes as he makes his way up the mountain to deliver a new hope. And he says this, starting, he says, I this is from last week, he said, that God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And our, and our understanding of this passage was actually this, it's up there, that those who recognize their need for God are blessed because they are, they belong to, and they make up the reign of God both now and in the kingdom to come. And this first beatitude, it, it really highlighted the individual recognition and response to God. It was seeing and acknowledging that we, as human beings, we are incapable of doing anything independent of God. That we as people, we are incapable of pleasing God on our own because of our own brokenness and failure because of our own disconnect. And we need God in every area of our life to lead us and sustain us and redeem us. And, and God says that, that those who do see their need for God, Jesus, Jesus said, it's to them that the kingdom belongs. It's, it's not to the rich. It's not to the powerful. It's not to the put together. It's not to those that the world would say matter. No, it's to the people who see their need. Because as they surrender to God, and as they find supply in God, they become the reign of God. And God supplies them. The kingdom is theirs because they are the kingdom. And this was last week. Now, building off this single verse, Matthew 5, 3, of individual recognition, Jesus continues in verse four with a beatitude for today that moves beyond individual and into um, a collective response. And he says this, it'll be on the screen. He says, God blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted. One more time. God blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted. And much like last week, there is just so much buried within the context and the original language in this verse that we need to see to help bring these 10 words to life. Because as 21st century Americans, I think it can be tempting to read this and assume that what Jesus is saying is that God blesses those who are sad or that God blesses those who are emotionally affected by a circumstance because they will then be comforted. And it's easy to arrive at this conclusion, even though there is some truth to it, that's not actually what Jesus is getting to. And so I think a more accurate translation of verse 4 is actually something like this. And I just encourage you to write this down, take a picture, get it out into the world, because this is Matthew 5, 4, from the context and the language. Those who grieve the current state of the world are blessed because they will find comfort in the end. Those who grieve the current state of the world are blessed because they will find comfort in the end. 
This is our only verse for today. Let's break it down. Two parts. We're going to be looking at those who grieve and will find comfort. Those who grieve will find comfort, starting with those who grieve. Jesus is saying once again to a people that likely live in active mourning because of their daily circumstances. He's speaking to a people who felt a constant disconnect between expectations and reality. He said to those who grieve the current state of God's good world, he said those who recognize the depravity, the brokenness, the confusion and pain, God calls them those who grieve what is, knowing what should be. God calls them blessed. Now, okay, I think we all know the current state of the world. I just gave you a little recap, but we see it every time we turn on the news or scroll on Facebook. We, we know the current state, and, it, and I think at least on a basic level, we understand what should be. We know what is, and I think on a basic level, we understand what should be, this, this perfect paradise found in the garden that we saw in the beginning. We understand what is and what should be, but I think, I, I think we miss out on quite a bit. The one thing we miss out on quite a bit from this verse is, is simply what it means to grieve. What it means to grieve in response. And I, and I don't know if this is because we don't like feeling bad. I, I don't like feeling bad. I don't know if it's because, you know, this constant overload of bad news coming at us all the time, because that's, that's coming. But grieving isn't something many of us choose to embrace. And it's certainly not something most of us want to be good at, right? And yet, Jesus says, to those who grieve, God calls blessed. So what does it mean to grieve? Well, I see two things within the grieving process. Grieving starts with seeing. Grieving starts with seeing. It's living with open eyes to what is and what God says should be. It's living with open eyes to what is and to what God says should be. Grieving starts with seeing the space between paradise lost and paradise found. And allowing that disconnect, that space, that separation, allowing that to affect you, not just sympathetically, not just passively from a distance, like, oh man, I just feel so bad for them, but empathetically by pacing yourself in the middle of the brokenness. This is what it means to grieve. It's seeing and then moves to surrendering of your own thoughts, your own opinions, about how things got there. So it's seeing the problem and then surrendering why you believe it got there so you can move past judgment and feel deeply about what's happening. And I think that this is actually a huge challenge, at least for me, and I imagine for most of us. Because once we actually see, once we get our heads out of the sand to recognize what's happening, I think it's an in the instinct we have is to kind of callously look at the symptoms as, as self-induced, like, oh man, I, I'm so sorry that you found yourself there. You should have been more careful. Like, oh man, you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you got there. You should have known better. You should have set better boundaries. You should have, you should have had more discipline. Oh, you should, have, you should have quit sooner. You made your bed. I, I guess now you have to sleep in it, right? I think about something that happened just this past week close to home, where we were, uh, close to where we were in Milwaukee. Right? A man shows up to work. I don't know if you saw this on the news. Man shows up to work, right? With a gun, shoots five of his, his coworkers, then kills himself, right? And what's the response? They're shock, right? Because this is a tragedy. It's a trauma. It's pain, of course. Our reaction is shock. But then somehow, the same day, the same day, there's this immediate shift away from compassion, right, to realism. And I can't even tell you how many arguments I saw about the Second Amendment in response to the shooting. Folks pointing fingers about the source of the symptoms instead of seeing and feeling and being affected by this unbelievable loss. But this is not the heart that God is calling us to. He never said, blessed are those who can see and judgmentally evaluate the current state of the world, did he? No, he did not. He's saying those who see and remember that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Those who see paradise lost and then look past the symptoms with empathy. 
It's those who grieve, God says, are blessed. It's those who grieve, those who see past the symptoms with empathy. Those who grieve. And now here's the second part. They're blessed because God says they will find comfort in the end. Blessed because they will find comfort. They'll find peace and relief from the pain caused by the current state of the world. They'll find peace in the end. And we catch a glimpse of this end, the one that Jesus was promising to the poor in spirit and those who mourn. We see a glimpse of it in the book of Revelation chapter 21 where it says this. It'll be on the screen. This is the glimpse into the end. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. The sea in the first century was this image for chaos and uncertainty. So I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the uncertainty, the disconnect, the, the tension that we felt was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. And this is it right here. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death, no more sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Another translation says the former things have passed away. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. This is the end. This is the the perfect peace and the eternal comfort that will come for those who recognize their need for God and grieve, mourn the current state of the world. It's a new heaven and a new earth, just like we saw in the beginning, where God was living with his people. No more pain, no more tears. No more school shootings, no more cancer, no more, no more divorce, no more uh, uh, houses being taken away from families, no more grieving for the former things are dead. They're gone. Paradise that was lost in Revelation chapter 21 is now found because the God of all comfort is making all things new. And this is the promise, right? This is the blessing for the end. There is no disconnect between what is and what will be. It's all right. It's all made new. It's all perfect because God came to us and made things right. And it's this encouragement that we see in Revelation chapter 21, right? It's this encouragement that Jesus gave those mourning in Matthew 5 as as he called them to repent as he called them to return to the authority of God. He said, listen, God is near to those who need him, to those who are wrecked by what they see and experience in this cultural moment. God is near and always will be. He is with them in the end, but here's the good news, right? He also promises to be with those who need him in the middle. And and I I know we've talked about a lot today. I know that we cover a lot of ground here on Sunday mornings, and and I don't know all your church background or your church history, but I I know that many of us here are making our way through a season that we never thought we'd face. And so hear me when I say, and, and I need you to hear me clearly, that God will bring perfect peace in heaven, full stop. What we see for the end will come. But I also need you to understand that, that here in the waiting, Here in the paradise that's been lost, God still says he will be found by his people. That even now that God is with us. Which is exactly what we heard in 2 Corinthians and John 16 at the very beginning of this message, right? But let me read it one more time if you you don't remember. See, it says this. It'll be on the screen. It says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is merciful Father and the source of all comfort, he comforts us in our, in our troubles, not later but today, so we can comfort others, not later but today. When they are troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, 
the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. And Jesus, right, he doesn't pull any punches. He's not trying to throw rose-colored glasses on us at all. He's just saying, the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. I'm sure that most of us have already felt it. Most of us have already experienced it, right? When you'll be scattered, each one to your own way, leaving him alone, right? Yet I am not alone because the Father is with him. Jesus says, I've told you all of this that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you. Here on earth, right? You will have many trials and many sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. God is with us. God is with us even now, working to bring paradise back to the hearts and minds through Christ. God is with us, working to bring paradise back to our lives through Christ, through his spirit, through his ways, through his words, through his practices, through his perspectives. And he does this, he does all of this, right? Big picture, 30,000 feet. He does this because he loves us. Because he loves you. And he doesn't just love you, he loves loving you. And he is so deeply grieved by what the world has become. God sees what is. He does, and he's not looking away. God sees what is, he's not hiding in heaven, oblivious to what's happening. Now from the beginning, from the very beginning, God saw and felt this disconnect. God was grieved and felt this tension and said, this, this isn't right. This isn't how it's supposed to be. God saw. He saw past the symptoms, right? He saw with compassion. He saw with love. And, and, and what's so beautiful is that God's heart for us didn't stop at, at just seeing and feeling. No, God chose to respond with action. God chose to do something about it, to bring comfort to pain to bring solutions to our problems, to meet us in our mess and make peace in this world at war, to speak a future of what will be in the midst of what is for all who see the need. He spoke a future made possible through Christ. Through Christ, through his sacrifice on the cross. A future made possible that God even now continues to bring comfort through. And if there's one thing I need you to remember today is that this is what God did for you. This is what God did for us. He has been working to bring peace to your heart since before you were born. This is what's available for those who grieve. Comfort is possible for those who grieve. So... Okay, so as we close today, we're going to be closing in just a minute. The band can come on up. Man, there's a lot in one verse. But as we close and remember this promise from Matthew 5, with support from 2 Corinthians and John 16, that comfort will come both now and forever for God's people. As we remember what God said in his scriptures, I, I just wonder... And I always wonder, because God has spoken, right? And God has told us what's true, but God is still speaking through his scriptures, right? The spirit, he gave us these scriptures, but the spirit is with us as we read these scriptures. And so God said something, but God is still saying something. And so every week I wonder what God is saying to you. Every week I wonder what God is saying here as we consider what it means for us. I wonder what God is saying to those of us who are willingly oblivious and sheltered to the current state of things. I wonder what God is saying to those of us who are overwhelmed currently by what is, and so we turn off the news and escape to a life of fiction. I wonder what this promise means for us who are still on the fence, like, Still trying to make sense of, of if God is real and, and like if God is real, then why do bad things happen to good people? And all, 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 you know, I just, I wonder. And, and then lastly, I just wonder what this means for those of us who just stepped into like an unexpected season of pain. 
that you just can't seem to see him make a way out of on your own. And now you're here and you're at church and you just had this really great cup of coffee and the music was so uplifting and encouraging. And now there's this pastor wearing all black, again, very optimistic, right? And he's just like, and he's like, God, God wants to bring you comfort. And inside, deep inside you, you're, you're just thinking like, prove it. Prove it. I need it. I need the peace that you're talking about. But everywhere I look, I find conflict. Everywhere I look, I see what is and what should be. And there's this massive gap. And so now what? Pastor, I need what you have. I, I need this good news. So now what? I, I, this is what God said. But I just keep wondering what God is saying to each of us and how God is calling us to respond. I think for maybe, <clears throat> for some of us, it's simply that God is trying to wake us up to see with fresh eyes to the realities of the world that are impacting you and others around you. And that we would seal it, see it, and then allow it to affect it, us like it affects God. Let me just ask you, when you turn on the news and you see the tragedies, do you allow it to affect you like it affects God? I think that this is what God is calling us to, looking past the, the calloused judgment into a posture of compassion. That we would allow what we see to, to influence our heart and to give us a sense of empathy. Maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe more than just seeing, maybe for you it's receiving. Maybe the comfort that God wants to bring you uh, like, I, I don't know, maybe for some reason it's just been really hard for you to receive. Like you believe it in theory, but to receive it, you just don't know how to receive it. And, and, and now I know that there's pain in this room, there's confusion in this room, there's brokenness in this room. There's all these different things and you're just trying to figure out how to make it through. But just like Jesus said, right? He said that time is coming. We're gonna experience some garbage this side of heaven. The time is coming. Here on earth, you'll have many trials and sorrows, but, but the good news is that I have overcome the world. I've overcome the world. I'm the living hope. I'm not just a hope for today. I'm a living hope forever. Amen. And so I don't know if that's you today and you just need to receive some good news, some receive some comfort, the comfort that Jesus died to bring. Or maybe, maybe, this is what I pray, maybe, when you hear this encouragement from Matthew and Corinthians and, and John, maybe you're captured by the invitation of comfort, but also by the expectation to meet others and theirs. The invitation, the expectation that God meets us, right, in our troubles, and he does that so we can go and meet others and theirs. God shows us comfort in our mess so we can go in the thick of it for others and show comfort to them. So then they know who God is and they know what God is like. And so maybe you've seen long enough. Maybe your eyes have been open your whole life. Maybe you've allowed this to feel. Maybe you've received the comfort from God and he is just priming you to go and bring comfort to others. That's what I pray. Maybe you just need to go and be a comfort to the grieving. I don't know, all, all I know for certain is that, that God is here and that God is with us and he is working to bring peace to a world of war. God is here, he's working to bring the paradise that was lost to sin, to make it available to be found for anyone who needs it. So, so where are you at today, right? Little internal audit. As you think about these scriptures, where are you at today? The band is gonna lead us in just a moment in a time of reflection, a time of uh, response and a time of, of processing through, uh, through the Lord's table, through communion. Such a perfect time to take communion when we think about the comfort that came through the sacrifice of Jesus. And so practically the, the ushers or the communion team are going to come down and they're going to serve you. They'll pass the elements Take the, take the bread. Uh, everything is gluten-free now, so everyone can take it. Um, take the bread, take the cup. 
And as, as your reflection is happening and it's this moment, you, you are in control of this moment. You take the bread when you want and you can drink the cup when you want. No one needs to give you permission right now. Also, if someone in here has more severe allergies, we have a station in back with hand sanitizer and all that good stuff. And so we don't want to limit anyone from receiving today. We practice open communion at the church. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've given your life to Jesus and surrendered to his ways, then you are welcome to receive today. But where are you at as we start to process this, right? Do you, do you need the comfort of God today? Hallelujah, I do. Do you need to grieve the current state of things today? Absolutely. pray some courage over you right now. Because this is tough stuff, right? This isn't just opening up an Amazon box to find the clothes don't fit, right? We're talking about a far larger disconnect that we're facing every single day. So I just want to pray courage for you that you would begin to see the realities of the world. That you'd begin to feel the comfort that God, that God came to bring that after you've received this, this comfort that you'd be open and you'd be brave enough to go back into the fore to bring comfort to others who need it the most. God is with us. God is real. He is good. He loves us and he leads to peace. So let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your compassion and your mercy. God, we thank you for your sacrifice that you've, that you've died to be able to, to bring comfort and to bring this perfect paradise, this perfect end to us. But God, as we live in the middle, we ask that you would just open our eyes to the realities of others. God, that you'd open our eyes to the current state of things. God, that you'd help us see our neighbors in need and you would give us the courage to go and and care and bring comfort, God, that you would help us receive the care and the comfort that you died to give, God, that we'd be able to process that maybe for the first time. But God, more than anything, God, just help us understand again what life in your eternity and your kingdom is like. God, that you are for us and that you are with us and you're always calling us back, always calling us back to a greater life of obedience and glory for your name. So God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for everything. We know we don't deserve it, but you still call us sons and daughters. So God, help us live like the family we've been adopted into. So God, again, thank you again for today. God, just receive our praise. God, speak to us, open our eyes. God, be with us as we, as we remember you together with the bread and the cup. And in worship, God, as we, as we take this second offering for, to care for the direct needs of those in our community, our benevolence offering. God, just be with us as we sing and as we go. God, we love you and it's in your name that we pray. And we all said...